Phillips. I'm back again with um, the, the vlog that we have been doing for the last few weeks entitled The Jesus You Never Knew. One of the things I've emphasized uh, repeatedly is that we are not in this series, we are not concerned so much about the people that Jesus met, but we are concerned uh, and we want to bring to you the G some aspects of the Jesus that people met. This vlog number 13, I have entitled, I Can See Clearly Now. Most of you can identify with that, with that uh, phrase. Uh, of course, it is, uh, it was invented, <laughs> it's a song that was invented by Johnny Nash in 1972. I can see clearly now And those of us who are from the diaspora, we will remember that it was made famous by the Jamaican Jimmy Cliff. I want to use a, as a backdrop to this blog, Luke's Gospel chapter 15 and 11 to, through 32. We will not take the time to read it, but you know the story. It is a, the story of lostness and of what do people do to recover that which was lost. Let me tell you a little story. The end of the world had come and God looks over the millions and millions of people and says to them welcome to heaven I want the woman to go with St. Peter go now and follow St. Peter and go on into heaven but to the men he said I want you to form two lines the first line to the left of me is for men who dominated their women on earth. The second line to the right is for men who were dominated by their women. Okay, now line up. There was a lot of movement and a lot of commotion and a length of time, but eventually the women are now gone and now there are two lines. The line of the men who dominated, who were dominated by their women were 150 miles long. But the line of men that dominated women was only one man. God is angry and God says, you men should be ashamed of yourselves. I created you in my image and yet you were all dominated by your wives. Look at the only one of my sons that stood up and made me so proud. Learn from him. He turns to the man and says, tell them my son, how did you manage to be the only one in that line <laughs> and the man says I don't know my wife told me to stand here Jesus one of the things I notice about uh, Jesus is that Jesus showed and demonstrated to us the type of humanity that most Christians don't identify with because we, we in the deification of this Christ, we seem to lose sight of the fact that Jesus was, was so human. He came from a nowhere town. I mean, J J this, the, the, Nazareth, they tell us, had only about, was a village of only about 200 to 400 people. Jesus' hometown is mentioned nowhere, either in the Old Testament or in the Talmud, which notes in, in the midst of many, many and dozens of, of villages. 
In fact, the New Testament is literally a joke when it comes to the mention of Nazareth. In the Gospel of John, you would remember when a man named Nathaniel hears the Messiah is Jesus of Nazareth. He says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? He's dissing Jesus' crummy backwater town. This humanity of Jesus, for instance, Jesus didn't know, this might surprise you, but Jesus probably didn't know everything. Ah, some of you might say that's rather ridiculous or uh, sacrilegious. This is a, a thorny theological question. If Jesus is divine, wouldn't he know all things? <laughs> Indeed, on several occasions, he even predicted his death and resurrection. On the other hand, if he had a human consciousness, he needed to be taught something before he could know it. The Gospel of Luke says that when Jesus was a young man, he progressed, quote unquote, he progressed in wisdom. That means he learned some things. Otherwise, how would he progress? I can see clearly now this Jesus. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus initially refuses to heal the daughter of a non-Jewish woman, saying rather sharply to her, it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She corrected him, but when she replies that even the dogs get the crumbs from the table, Jesus softens and he heals a daughter. He seems to be learning that his ministry extends beyond the Jewish people. Jesus learned that. He progressed as he went along. I can see clearly now this Jesus. Something else. Rather than the little blue-eyed baby in a cradle in Bethlehem. I believe that Jesus was a tough guy. Not, not the type that we look at and Jesus is so often portrayed as this effeminate, soft guy. He was not. From age 12 to 30, Jesus worked in Nazareth as a carpenter. Now, is they said, is not this the carpenter? Said the crowd when he begins to preach. The word used for Jesus' profession as a carpenter in the original Greek is tekton, T-E-K-T-O-N. The tr traditional um, definition and translation is carpenter, but most contemporary scholars say it is more like a general craftsman. Some would even translate it to that Jesus was just a day laborer. A tecton would have made doors, tables, lampstands, and plows, but he probably also built stone walls and helped with uh, house construction. It was tough work, and Jesus was going around the villages, lugging tools, wood, and stones all over Galilee. Jesus doesn't simply stand aside on a stage having dreamly existed uh, in, in that type of dreamy world, but Jesus was tough. I can see clearly now. Something else, I would suggest as I have read the scripture, Jesus needed me time. Uh, as parents, we often tell our children, look, I need some me time. In relationships, sometimes we say to each, to our partners, uh, I need some me time. Well, Jesus needed some me time. The gospels frequently talk of Jesus 
having to withdraw from the crowds and even from his disciples. Today, by the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus carried out much of his ministry, you can see how close the towns were and how natural it would have been for the enthusiastic crowds to press in on Jesus. There is even a cave in the shoreline not far from Capernaum, his base of operations where he may have prayed. It's called the Eromos Cave, E-R-E-M-O-S Cave. And it is true, uh, tradition has it that Jesus would often recluse himself. Jesus needed me time. I can see clearly now this Jesus. There's something else. Um, Jesus didn't want to die. Hmm. As Jesus approaches his death and prays hard in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus says, remove this cup. It's a blunt prayer addressed to the Father whom he affectionately calls Abba. Jesus doesn't want to die. Unlike the way that Christians today portray Jesus as courting death and even desiring it like any human being, the idea of death was terrifying to Jesus. My soul is sorrowful unto death. Yes, I can see clearly now. Let me give you a few things that about this human Jesus. Number one, Jesus was a friend to sinners. He commanded, he commended a groveling tax collector over a God-fearing Pharisee. The first person to whom Jesus revealed himself as the Messiah was the Samaritan woman who had a history of five failed marriages, marriages and was currently living with yet another man. With his dying breath, Jesus himself pardoned the thief on the cross who would have zero opportunity of spiritual growth. All too often, sinners feel unloved by a church that in turn keeps altering the definition of sin exactly the opposite of who Jesus really was. Jesus was a friend of sinners. Number two, Jesus was the God-man. Jesus, Jesus' audacious claim uh, about himself posed what may be the central problem of all history. The dividing point between Christianity and all other religions is this God man. No other religion has claimed that their, their hero is also a divine incarnation upon this earth. Although Muslims and increasingly Jews respect Jesus as a great leader and prophet, no Muslim can imagine Muhammad claiming to be Allah and a Jew claiming Moses to be Yahweh. So therefore, it's only Jesus that brings this God-man element into our theology and into the way we live our lives. Unlikely, the disciples, as we have seen, were inept conspirators. And in fact, the gospel, the gospels portray them as resistant to the very idea of Jesus' divinity. Every disciple went through this doubting about the resurrection. Number three, I think I can see clearly now. I, I think Jesus portrayed God 
in a different dimension than the disciples or those around were known to. Jesus' disciples grew up in an environment of not even wanting to mention the name of God. In these ways, Jesus' profound changes in how we view God brought to us and brought to the people at that time a reality that Jesus was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He, this, this portrait of God, as, and, and he, he used the term Abba Father, became a standard for all Christians in that day. This portrait of God in terms of understanding our own humanity I can see clearly now Jesus that people met was also the lover his own Jesus's own stories about God's love expresses a quality almost of desperation and that's why we use uh, as a backdrop to this vlog the 15th chapter of Luke's gospel and when you get a chance read it it talks about the, lo the lost coin and the woman going after the lost coin and until she finds the coin and then she tells and Jesus tells the story of this lost sheep that went astray and in the midst of this, there is rejoicing in the son, uh, that the prodigal son that had come back. The bottom line of this is that Jesus, that God is a lover of humanity. God is a lover of creation. Henry Nouwen had an opportunity to talk about this God. And Henry Nouwen revealed this Jesus connection with God in such a way that <laughs> Henry Nouwen says, Jesus is the prodigal son of the prodigal father who gave away everything the father had entrusted to him so that I could become like him and return with him to his father's home the prodigal jesus is the prodigal i can see clearly now number five jesus revealed a portrait of humanity the incarnation showed the greatness of the, uh, uh, the greatness of his misery by the greatness of the remedy that he required in life we tend to excuse many faults by saying it's just human a man gets drunk a woman has an affair a child tortures an animal a nation goes to war that's just human but jesus put a stop to such talk by enacting what we ought to be he showed who we are meant to be that's why Pilate cried out, Behold the man. I find that Jesus was fully human. And the Jesus that I want to leave with you in this vlog is a compassionate Jesus. A Jesus who cares for humanity. And as Christians, I think what the world needs more than anything else is a broken heart remembering the wounds that Jesus had and to understand that we translate that into our own life and to see how we can touch the humanity of this Jesus. Jesus had a human body. He was born of a woman. As a child, he grew and he became strong. Jesus was tired. Jesus was hungry. Jesus was thirsty. Jesus bled. Jesus died. 
and Jesus looked just like an ordinary man. Number six, Jesus was the wounded healer. There is of course the plain fact that Jesus commanded us to remember his death when we gather together in worship. He did not need to say, do it in remembrance of me. But Palm Sunday and Easter, not clearly, he did not want us to forget what happened on Calvary. Not necessarily Easter, not necessarily Palm Sunday, but this Calvary, which depicted the woundedness, the pain. Sometimes, if we are very fortunate, those are the sorts of wounds that become a part of our ministry and a part of our life as we try to live out this Christian life and this Christian ministry. Many years ago, I heard the story that I want to read to you now. The author is unknown, but I think it demonstrates the Jesus that we never knew and the kind of life that we ought to live today. It's called this pair of hands. One of the most remarkable stories of compassion reborn began in a young intern's life one rainy night on the train. Weary from a 20-hour day in the inner city hospital, he waited in coach till the last call for dinner was announced by the porter. Med school was over, but he had to survive his residency or he'd not get a license to practice medicine. Bone tired, he made his way in the swaying train to the diner two doors or two cars up and he stood in line. Then he noticed the smell. He turned to see a guy standing behind him, dirty, disheveled, and reeking with alcohol. The doctor had an intuitive sense that he was about to be hit up for a meal and disgusted, he returned to his seat. He was too tired for conversation. But he was hungry and he finally went to dinner. By now, the bum, as he thought of him, was nowhere in sight. A porter waved him forward to a seat by the window. He sat and without looking up, began to read the menu. Then he noticed it. That fetid stench of alcohol mixed with sweat and dried urine, the bum was sitting at the table and spoke to the doctor. Sir, I'm hungry and I have no money for food. In a flash of conviction, an ancient scripture gripped the doctor's heart. Sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Duly chastened, the doctor agreed to buy his supper but confessed to himself a lingering sense of disgust. The evening train, like a silvery ghost in the moonlight, rocked along. Rain tapped against the window. Supper had been served and as they ate, the internist noticed something odd about the guest's right hand. Three fingers were missing. He managed a fork in a clumsy sort of way. 
only with a thumb and index finger. Unable to check his natural curiosity, the doctor remarked, I have operated on hands and I noticed that you have lost most of your right hand. Yeah, the, vag the vagrant began. I was raised in a Missouri farm by my grandparents. One day, I was 14 and we were blasting stumps and somehow I misjudged time and distance. The emergency room doctors agreed they'd have to amputate because my hand was so far gone. But a retired bone surgeon happened to walk in and said he'd be willing to save what was left of my right hand at no charge. So that long day, he worked several hours removing bone fragments, reconnecting ligaments and muscle, rerouting veins and nerves all to save the hand of a kid he never knew for a paycheck he'd never receive. To be honest, the bum continued, I'm left with scars, but I'll never forget that doctor who was kind enough to save part of my hand. They finished supper and the doctor returned to his seat with hot tears Singing his eyes, he prayed, Oh God, forgive my insensitivity to this poor man who has suffered more injury from despair than he ever could have suffered from dynamite. Teach me that if I am to be a true blessing to mankind, I will need something more than skill intellectual and money teach me that i'll need to be a man of great compassion and passion restore my soul put a new love in me for people i'm not inclined to like because the well is deep and i'm running on empty that was blood number 13 I can see clearly now. See you on Sunday. God bless you. Sounds right.